Hey guys, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. Now, as you can obviously tell, we've finally got our FD RX7 project car up and running. And the reality is we actually have had it running for a fair while and it's given us the opportunity to put the Adaptronic Modular ECU through its paces. For me, that's been a learning curve. As with most people getting familiar with a new ECU, there is a little bit to learn and I'm hoping to share some of that knowledge in today's webinar, which will be an introductory look at the Adaptronic Eugene software for their modular range of ECUs. Obviously we're using our FD RX7 to showcase this but the reality is that uh, what we're looking at during this introduction to Adaptronic is going to be applicable regardless what engine platform you're running the ECU in. Before you get into that though, just an update on what's been going on around the HPA labs over the last couple of weeks. We missed last, last week's webinar because I was away. Uh, one of the products that has arrived recently which we're itching to test out. It will jump across to my laptop screen. Uh, we've got a set of ITBs, individual throttle body, bodies for the LS uh, range of engines. So this is from RHD Engineering uh, in Australia. So they're using a billet uh, uh, throttle body here which is then adapted onto or mounted up onto this uh, cast lower section which we can see here and that obviously adapts then to the LS cylinder head. Uh, these are available for both the cathedral port as well as the rectangle port later model cylinder heads and it is a drive-by-wire setup which is nice if you are going to be wanting to keep the drive-by-wire application uh, with some of the later model cars. Now there are a couple of interesting aspects with this setup. We obviously haven't got the engine up and running so we can't actually put this to the test yet but uh, we've got the fuel rail here. Uh, I've actually got that mounted upside down but that's neither here nor there for today's uh, explanation. We've got the factory injector bosses which we can see down here. So normally as with most modern uh, port fuel injected engines the injectors are mounted right down at the interface between the intake manifold and the cylinder head giving them a nice clear shot at the back of the intake valves. Now that's good for OEs particularly for emissions but sometimes isn't necessarily ideal if power uh, is our main focus. Quite often we'll see particularly with naturally aspirated dedicated race cars the injectors are actually mounted outside of the intake trumpet, so somewhere uh, up over here. Uh, the idea behind this is to try and get better atomization or mixing between the fuel and air, atomization and mixing. So you've got a nice homogeneous mixture of fuel and air entering the cylinder, entering the combustion chamber. And the idea here is we're going to get a better combustion event, uh, more thoroughly burning all of the available fuel and air. So RHD Engineering have actually added another set of bosses up here on the ITBs. So you can actually mount your injectors in two different locations. Uh, again, we haven't put this to the test. Their own back-to-back -back testing has shown something in the region of about a 20 horsepower uh, gain from doing this. So I'll be interested to see if we can uh, get the same sort of results. And when it comes to ITBs, there are a few intricacies with the tuning. Uh, let's just have a look here. So first of all, looking down on the individual throttle bodies here. Uh, we've got all of the individual throttle plates and one of the keys, one of the areas that you can really easily come unstuck is not having the throttle openings or the throttle bodies balanced, particularly at idle. And what this can result in is, uh, particularly at idle where the throttle butterflies are almost completely closed, we get a very large difference in airflow for a very, very small amount of throttle opening. And what this means is that if, not, if all of the throttle plates plates aren't in exactly the same place, we can have quite dramatically different airflow into different cylinders. And if this is not done correctly, we can have a lot of problems with the engine running smoothly at idle. Uh, often you'll find there'll be one or two cylinders that'll be so lean they'll actually be having a lean misfire creates drivability problems off idle as well. So it's something that really needs to be dealt with when we are setting up a set of individual throttle bodies, regardless what engine these are going on. And uh, one of the easiest ways to do this is actually with an old school carb tuning tool, which is a carb balancer. And essentially this just blocks off the uh, individual throttle body. Uh, we put this into the butterfly, sorry, into the trumpet itself. And it essentially measures airflow uh, into the throttle body and what we're going to do is go through and adjust each of the throttles until the airflow is equal and if we jump across here we can see that this is done with this little adjuster between the throttle linkages. This I'll admit 
is a real pain to do, but fortunately you only need to do it once. But getting this right can make a dramatic difference between uh, the with the drivability and the way the engine runs again, particularly at idle and very close to closed throttle uh, situations. Once you're up above about 20 or 30% throttle, the airflow variations between the different cylinders aren't so critical, or aren't as significant I should say. It's uh, just when we are closed throttle, the airflow rel relationship to throttle opening is very non-linear so we get quite dramatic differences there. Now the couple of aspects with individual throttle bodies no matter how it's done is that conventionally in the aftermarket at least we're most likely to use the speed density operating system where we use manifold absolute pressure as the signal or as the uh, load input for our fuel and our ignition tables. Now when we convert to individual throttle bodies first of all it is a little bit trickier to get the manifold pressure signal. Uh, this can be done it needs a little bit more work you need to basically tap each of the throttle bodies or the manifold post throttle body on each cylinder and then run this to a balance bar so that'll give you a pressure signal but unfortunately it's not a really good load indication anymore and uh, what we can find is it's very difficult to get good resolution in our fuel and ignition maps. You'll find that uh, maybe you'll be able to get your fueling perfect uh, wide under wide open throttle conditions uh, but it'll be all over the show at part throttle. The solution to this is to run alpha N, uh, where instead of manifold pressure as our load signal, we use throttle position. So a few intricacies there. One other aspect which is quite novel, I personally haven't seen this before, is the adaption of a drive-by-wire throttle motor uh, to operate this whole system. So you can see it is a conventional single throttle drive-by-wire motor, and RHD Engineering has just removed the butterfly here, and they've got a linkage made up that runs off that shaft, that runs down to some bell cranks which then operates both sets of throttle bodies. So a little bit unique again, uh, quite interested to get a chance to have a look at this and uh, see how that all works. Once we get that engine up and running, that's actually destined to go in an FD RX-7 as well. We're trying to sort of span both sides of the FD RX-7 market. We've got this one that I'm sitting in now with a Turbo 13B. We're also going to have our naturally aspirated LS as well, so that should be a little bit of fun. That engine, uh, if you haven't been following along, is a stroker. It's about 6.3 litres in capacity. Started with a, a 5.7 litre LS1. It's running a K1 Technologies stroker kit. We're running a set of Wiseco pistons, giving us about 11.5 to 1 compression. So uh, it's built to be a fairly decent uh, compression ratio for pump gas. We've also got a reasonably decent cam in there as well so that should un unleash a bit more power and torque than stock. We're expecting that should be somewhere around about 500, 550 flywheel horsepower but with plenty of drivability and low end torque. Nothing uh, particularly wild there. Uh, now I just want to also cover off, that's great, I've just been signed out but uh, we'll get past that. I just wanted to cover off uh, an Instagram I put up last week uh, on our HPA Instagram. If you're not following us on HPA 101 please make sure you do so. Uh, we post up interesting content uh, as often as we can so there's bound to be something that you'll pick up and learn there. So we quite often see these car these days in race cars where switch gear has been mounted up on the steering wheel allowing the driver to keep both hands on the steering wheel and control some of the vital aspects of the race car. Maybe the power delivery even through to talking back to the crew uh, on the radio. So this allows the driver to stay in control of the car, you don't need to take your eyes off the road as well, generally you'll program yourself to really understand where these buttons are. But it does add one layer of complexity which is how do we get the signals from the switch gear here on the steering wheel back into uh, the chassis. So conventionally this is done usually with a curly cord but as you can see on this Audi R8 GT3 steering wheel we've got uh, uh, a number of different functions there, there's switches as well as we've got some uh, rotary encoders here for aspects such as uh, traction control and ABS tuning. And getting all of that data normally would require uh, a power uh, 0 to 5 volt, uh, sorry a 5 volt regulated power supply, a sensor 0 volt and then analog voltage inputs for the potentiometers as well as maybe a digital inputs for each of the switch. 
switches. So what this ends up with is a fairly bulky cord, particularly when you are running a lot of functionality like this. Uh, there are some unique options coming out. One that we've actually used ourselves is a ECU Master CAN switch pad. So this is a really small uh, switch pad. It's just a PC board that mounts on the back of the steering wheel or wherever you want it to. You can run all of your wires straight into that switch panel and then all you actually need running between the chassis and the steering wheel is power, ground and can high and can low. So it makes it really simple. You've just got four wires in that curly cord. There are other options if you want to get a little bit flasher though. Uh, Crontec in particular make a quick release steering hub which essentially has a dirt Auto Sport connector mounted into it, so the Auto Sport, the two halves of the Auto Sport connector, mate and uh, un disconnect when you install and remove the quick release steering wheel. So then you run your wiring down essentially through the middle of the steering rack or the steering uh, column, I should say, not the steering rack. So that's one nice solution. Uh, however, they are quite pricey. Uh, we are starting to see as well quite a few options come out which are wireless, which uh, is another nice alternative, keeping things nice and simple. Obviously with the wireless option you do have to keep in mind the battery life for the transmitter that is in the steering wheel so that's something to consider. Uh, one of the other aspects there I just mentioned we're using the ECU Master CAN based switch pad and this is one of the really nice functions with CAN communications. We're seeing this really it's pretty mainstream now with OE manufacturers as well as most of the aftermarket standalone ECU manufacturers. The nice thing is it is a standardised protocol which means that you can mix and match different electronic modules and transmit the signals between different modules and different ECUs. Uh, for example here I've got a Haltech TCA8 which is a 8 channel thermocouple amplifier so you can plug your thermocouples in here and again all this requires is 12 volts ground and can high and low provided you know what the CAN template or CAN message setup is. You can read this into aftermarket standalone ECUs or basically any dash logger. Obviously if you are dealing with a Haltech product such as their ECU and dash it's as simple as just selecting that this unit is on the CAN bus and all of the information is there but with not a lot of additional work you can do that in uh, just about any aftermarket ECU or dash. Uh, likewise another little module I've got hanging around here in the car is this Link CAN to Lambda module. As its name implies, it is a wideband Lambda controller. Uh, it uses a Bosch LSU 4.9 Lambda sensor. And again, our wiring harness there, simple 4-pin DTM connector, 12 volts ground, CAN high and low. And again, you can get that information into just about any of those modules you like. Uh, just catching up on our YouTube channel. So we'll head across to that for a moment. And this is one of the videos we shot when we were over at Sydney Jamboree in Australia. Uh, this is uh, gives you a rundown on uh, what, at least at the time, I'm not sure if anyone's gone faster yet, was the world's fastest street legal uh, Nissan R32 Skyline GTR. So we're talking to Con from CRD uh, about what makes this car so fast. In particular it's using a 3.2 litre billet block which is becoming the norm with engines producing this sort of power. They're around about 2,500 horsepower on methanol at 80 psi. One of the interesting aspects and I've personally been involved with the R32 GTR drag racing for a number of years. The car that I was involved with at the time I was tuning it set and held the world four wheel drive record outright with a 741 around about 198, 200 mile an hour thereabouts and uh, one of the real big challenges is not actually making the power, it's the challenge of getting the power to the track. Uh, the car that I was involved with was running a, a, a Liberty air shifted 5 speed gearbox and we've really seen a massive improvement in the GTR drag times with a lot of the people running these going to uh, the likes of in this case a turbo 400 automatic transmission. Uh, so the, the nice function with the automatic transmission regardless whether it's power glide, turbo 400, whatever way you go is that it does reduce the torque interruption and the drivetrain shock on the gear shifts which is a real big problem with a manual gearbox even with a drag racing slider clutch like the heat treatments R32 GTR did run. So this tends to overcome
overcome the available traction on the gear shift and uh, the car can get really loose as it goes down the track. Uh, the automatic transmission, much smoother application of that power. The downside is that uh, regardless what you're doing with an automatic transmission, you're most assured there will be some amount of torque converter slip. So particularly on the top end, we tend to see the mile an hour not quite as, as good with an automatic transmission as a manual gearbox. However, uh, we're not racing for mile an hour, we're racing for ET. Interestingly, despite the fact that the car's putting out 2,500 plus horsepower, the factory R32 GTR transfer case is still attached to the back of that automatic transmission. That feeds power forward to the front axle line, and this is all controlled through the Motec M150 ECU running a special uh, specific package for the CRD car court and racing developments car. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that car, head across to our YouTube channel and check that out. It's our latest release that came out today. While you're there, make sure you subscribe. If you like that video, give us a thumbs up. And if you've got questions, ask those in the comments. Uh, lastly for today we are running another one of our giveaways and this time we are uh, giving away this PMU 16 from ECU Master. So this is a power management unit, power distribution module re re depending uh, on the sort of lingo that you want to use but essentially this allows you to do away with fuses and relays. We run our battery positive straight onto the positive stud here in the middle of the PMU. 16 channels as its name implies and uh, from the top of my head there's 25 amp and 15 amp outputs on this depending on uh, what you're actually trying to drive. So this allows you to program the outputs, you can program the way the outputs will be switched on and off, you can switch them via CAN messages, you can switch them via conditions, you can switch them via uh, direct wired switches up to the PMU. Nice thing with this is if you're integrating it with a CAN enabled ECU, you can switch things like your thermo fans and your fuel pumps with CAN messages which again just simplifies the wiring. The other really nice feature with the PMU is that if you do have a problem with any of the outputs, maybe you've got a fuel pump that's on the way out and it's just tripping uh, the fusing current which you can program electronically, you can also set the PMU to retry that output a certain number of times waiting for a set amount of time between resets and this will uh, allow you to possibly get get by, particularly for a race car, uh, that can be uh, a really big advantage, can allow you to get back to the pits uh, and actually affect a repair, so uh, that's a nice feature of, of uh, power distribution modules, gives you a little bit of redundancy, you don't actually have to physically remove a fuse and replace it, which would be the case in a normal circumstance. Now I did say lastly, but I've actually got one more thing that I just want to give you a, a sneak tease on here, which is our Toyota GT86 race car. Right now, as as I speak, we are four and a half weeks away from the first round of our South Island Endurance Series. For those who have been following us, you'll know that we are building up 3UZFE. Uh, without giving too many details away, we've had a few delays with that engine and we have made the uh, fairly large call to do a full engine swap. We're swapping in our Nissan SR20VE. And we can see there on my laptop screen a quick shot of pretty much how the car sits at the moment. We've got a Garrett GT30 attached to that engine along with a plasma man inlet manifold. Because we are on such a tight time frame, the team from Vidifab up in Christchurch, which it's about a six and a half hour drive north of us here in Queenstown. Uh, they were kind enough, uh, Lars and James, to drive down uh, on Friday. They worked through the weekend and did basically the lion's share of the fabrication work, which is the intercooler, the intercooler plumbing, the intake pipe, and the exhaust manifold, uh, sorry, the exhaust dump pipe and wastegate integration that you can see there. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into too much more detail on this. If you do want to learn a little bit more about this, you can check out the latest episode of our vlog where we go into a lot more detail about the ins and outs of why we've decided to go this way along with what was required. If you keep an eye on our YouTube channel as well, as we come up to the first round of the Endurance Series, we will be releasing weekly build updates so that you can keep up to date. Also doing some stories on our Instagram again, so check out HPA101 on Instagram to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on. Uh, what will probably be the basis of some Instagram story today as well as some of the cooling updates. We've got Tim uh, 
uh, slaving away on the design for some ducting. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be using cardboard or any paper-based derivatives in the final uh, installation, but it is actually really nice working with card like this. Really easy to work with, cut out. It's really cheap. Once you've got your uh, ducting designed properly, you can then actually make this out of alloy. You can make a mould for carbon, depending on how elaborate you want to get. So uh, that's the intake there at the front of the car. And uh, we're also working on some ducting that will be off to the side. So again, keep uh, your eye on our Instagram, HPA101. Keep an eye on our YouTube channel for all of those updates coming out. All right, thanks for watching. Give us a few moments here and we'll get started with today's webinar. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.